It's championship baseball on the horizon, but another episode of Valley Chats. I'm your host, Jesse Cook, and I'm with Alex Vergara, the Miners outfielder who's been all ABL second team and a league MVP. Now you've got revenge on your mind against the Glacier Pilots. What's the atmosphere like? Oh, it's going to be great. I'm looking forward to seeing all the fans coming out tonight. Um, there was a good show yesterday, and you know I think we put on a good show for them then, and um, I'm, I'm looking forward to even more coming out today, so we're all excited. Do you know that you have a special distinction in Alaska baseball history? So this season, Alex Vergara is the only defending ABL MVP to play both of the current MVPs in the playoffs. Because you went up against Nick Costello oh, yeah. in the semis and you got Blake Jackson coming tonight. <laughs> yeah, that's cool, I guess. Um, I, I, you know, I was the MVP last year. I didn't come up here trying to you know, get revenge on anything like that. but. Yeah, now you say it is cool, you know, playing against the, the other MVPs, yeah, I guess. And Alaska's a league with some pretty good history. You've got former major leaguers like Tom Seaver, Dave Winfield, Aaron Judge, Barry Bonds. What does it mean to you to be a part of a history like that? Yeah, no, that means a lot. I was actually talking to my host family about that the other night. We were going through the alumni of this league, and it's historic. I mean, it's been around for a long time. Like you said, Barry, bon Barry Bonds, Randy Johnson, and everyone's been up here. So uh, to play in a league like this, it's a... I would say once in a lifetime opportunity, but here I am again playing for the second time. Uh, so, but it's, yeah, it's just a lot of fun. Yeah. And what brought you back here? Um, so Ty texted me a couple times early on in the summer, and I I talked to my coaches at Lipscomb back at school, and we kind of decided that I was just going to take a little summer off, maybe you know go into the Cape a little bit later after the draft happens and stuff like that. Um, but after sitting at home for a couple weeks, and you know obviously I was working out and hitting and stuff like that but I just really miss playing you know because you can hit all the time in the cages lift all you want but nothing's quite like getting on the diamond and just playing you know so uh, just the love of the game brought me back to, to Alaska and this was kind of the one summer league that I could get into at such late notice um, and immediately get some at bats so uh, yeah I just kind of you know missed the game. Did you feel like there was any adjustment period because you hit a home run in your first game back? Yeah uh, well, it wasn't too big of a gap. I think it was only I only took you know two or three weeks off, um, and in that span, I was hitting every day and stuff like that. Um, so to come back up here, I will say, getting used to seeing a live arm after three weeks is is a kind of a big jump. Even during the season, when you take three, four, five days off, um, you don't have a game. That first at bat when you come back is always a little tough. Um, but yeah, I saw the ball well. Continue to see the ball well, and just having a lot of fun. And you're not the only returner from the 2022 team. So first, yes, assistant coach Kyle Watson, and head coach Ty LeBron, but also catcher Steven Lancia. What's it like playing with him again? Yeah, no, it's been great playing with Steve. Um, and whenever Ty was reaching out earlier in the season, I didn't think I was going to play. I was texting with Steve because I knew, you know, Steve was asked to come back up here too. A couple of the guys from last year asked to come. Um, and Steve, you know, he was hesitant at first whenever we talked about coming up here. And then he told me he was on board with it. And then I waited another week and Ty called me and, and I was like, all right, well, I can't just let Steve come up here by himself, you know, so I wanted to spend another summer with him. So yeah, that's why I came back up. And what's he like now that it's year two? He's a bit different this year, in a good way. He's, uh, he's, a, he's a leader for us. Not saying, you know, that he wasn't a leader last year, but being a returner, he's, he's got that experience. Um, and I think for me coming back, it was good to have another guy who's coming back with me just so you know, I've got I've got another guy to talk to about. Okay, well, what do we think about this? What do you think about that? Because he's been here. You know, he's, he was here last year, so uh, it's just good to have another mind to to kind of pick at. And you're coming back with head coach Ty LeBrun. What's he like as a coach, as a player's coach? Yeah, no, he's he's a player's coach, right? And I think Price talked about it earlier in his interview, where he knows you know how to have fun off the field. When it's time to have fun, he can have fun. But when it's time to turn it on, he does a great job of doing that. Um, and he really got us fired up uh, about playing yesterday with the Oilers and everything that, you know, transcribed before the game. Um, but, yeah, he really gets us going. He's a great guy to talk to, not only about baseball. You know, obviously he's a great coach, but you can talk to him about, you know, stuff that's going on in your life, anything like that. He's a great guy to just have a conversation with. So what does he do to support you as a player? He's always got your back. I mean, there's things that happen in this game where, a coach could flip a switch on you if you, you know, speak your mind or do something that's against what he's saying, something like that. Um, but if you got a problem or anything that you think, you know, needs to be addressed, you can go and talk to Ty about it. He's going to be open with you. He's going to be honest with you. And he doesn't treat you like, uh, like a statistic or a number. Like he, he cares about you as a person, 
not just as a player. Feels like all three coaches, Ty LeBron, Kyle Watson, Steve Hecker, they're all pretty laid back and have a good rapport with the players. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I've known Watson for a while now. He's been my summer coach since I first started uh, playing summer ball for college because we played back in a local league in Texas during COVID when they all got shut down, you know. Um, and then I actually got to come up here and play last year because of him because I was going to play in a, a summer league back in Texas, the TCL. And Watson told me that he was going to go to Alaska. And I was like, oh, you know, that's awesome. You know, obviously super happy for him to get that opportunity. And then he texted me pretty late in the summer and said that a spot just opened up. Um, and I was like, dude, I'll absolutely come up to Alaska. Like this is, it's a, you know, I said it already, but it's a once in a lifetime opportunity to come up here and, and get to experience everything that Palmer has to offer. I'm glad I get to play with the Matsu Miners, which, you know, is the best organization in the ABL hands down. Um, but yeah, the coaches are great. And you obviously have a special relationship with Kyle Watson. So you and K-Dub, as you said, go way back. What has changed about him since that first year of summer ball? Um, really, I think, you know, whenever you first get to meet a coach, you don't know a whole lot about him. You don't know, you know, what he's about or what he stands for and stuff like that. But even like, you know, since I've known him for three years now, uh, I mean, he's great. I've, I've got to meet his family a bunch of times. They came out to a couple of our games this year at Lipscomb. They flew out to Florida to, to see us play Stetson, which was super cool. Um, but his family's great. His wife's great. He's got great kids. Um, he's just a good guy to, to, to know, you know, because he's got some connections, everything like that. He's a great guy, and he always seems to have an answer for any problem that you have, so it's great to know him. And he had some answers when I asked him for stories about your friendship. I heard there was some incident at Clemson. Not an incident, really, but a a happening where he texted you during a game telling you what he thought you should do and he did exactly that. Yeah, so this is actually crazy. He, so he texted me before Clemson. We were playing in the conference tournament in Florida and we played three previous games before he texted me and they were decent games, like one for three games, one for four games, but I wasn't really driving the ball to the outfield like I usually do. And he sent me a text right before we played Liberty in the second to last game in that tournament. And he said, hey man, just like, just try to go right center with everything, try to hit, you know, line drives to right center. And I was like, all right, if, if I'm gonna keep rolling over, you know, obviously I gotta change something, right? So the next day we played Liberty and uh, I hit a home run to right center field. And I was like, all right, well, my approach feels great. I was seeing the ball well, making good contact. And the next day we played uh, Florida Gulf Coast and I hit three home runs that game. And I was like, all right, I really like this, you know, right center approach. And then we go and play Clemson. And I hit two more home runs there. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, Watson, he's a great guy. He's, he's a big baseball knowledge guy. And for him to text me and, and reach out and let me know what he was thinking, it really meant a lot to me because, you know, it shows that he cares, right? So, um, but yeah, he definitely helped out. And he's a big reason why I ended the season so strongly for Lipscomb. For reference, two of your seven home runs here have been to right center, including that grand slam against the Bucks. So what is K-Dub like out here as opposed to, say, in Texas? Yeah, um, you know, obviously in, in Texas, like this, these past couple of years, when I'm at school, he's still texting me and helping me out with stuff, but he's not as hands-on as he can be here while I'm spending time with him every day. So whether it's in the cage or we're, you know, we're out here taking BP, um, he can give you that feedback immediately, which has, you know, helped me tremendously throughout this summer because, you know, I'm seeing the ball great. And sometimes my approach gets too big, like I try to pull the ball or something like that. And he's always there, even at third base, sometimes during the middle of my bats, he'll just say, hey, you know, stay right center field. And it'll get me to calm down a little bit and really focus on what I'm trying to do that AB. Wow. And after his advice, didn't you hit one out of the Clemson ballpark? Yeah. Yeah, that one was hit pretty well. Uh, that, was, that was the first home run that game. And, and this guy just threw an 82 mile an hour changeup just right at the belt. Um, and it went over, the, went over the roof and left center. So... That's a good 400 feet, isn't it? Yeah, a little four, bit more. 455 feet, I think, is what it was. But the ball was flying there, so that helped me a little bit. I've seen that Clemson ballpark. From a distance, it looks huge. I can't imagine <laughs> what it's like from home plate. Yeah, no, it's a great field. And, and playing there for a regional was a beautiful atmosphere, right? It was sold out. All the fans were enthusiastic about everything going on. And, and to have a good game there, it was great. And after the game was over, actually, I was talking to my parents because they got to go out to that game. And we were having Clemson fans like coming up to me telling me, hey, great game and all this stuff, which I thought was, was super cool because there's a lot of parks that we played at, um, like, you know, Mississippi State, Auburn, you know, all those places. Where you, if you have a good game, you're not met with, hey, good job. You know, you're met with, oh, you know, get out of here. We don't like you, all this stuff. So, yeah, going to Clemson, it was a great environment to play in. And then, you know, I got to see my parents there, which was awesome. This is Alex Vergara, Episode 7 of Valley Chats. Now let's move to your JUCO play. 
You started out at Weatherford Community College. What do you think that did to boost your resume? Well, actually, I started out at Navarro Junior College. Right. Yeah, so I went to Navarro out of high school. Um, and then I went to, I, I stayed at Navarro for two years at that COVID year and then a year after that. And then I went to Weatherford again. Um, but Junior College has absolutely made me so much of a better baseball player than if I just went to a Division One out of high school. Because, you know, a lot of times kids, when they're in that recruiting process, they want to only, you know, go D1 or bust. And that's kind of how I was. Um, some things changed and then I ended up going to a junior college and, you know, I'm so thankful for that opportunity that um, Matt Pajinski gave me back there at Navarro. And then for Jeff Lightfoot to give me that opportunity to go play at Weatherford, I mean, it was great because I got to play every single day at the, the three years that I spent at JUCO. Uh, it was fantastic. And, and for me, I think getting in-game reps is invaluable. Like, it's the best thing that you can get. Because um, if you go to Division One, you know, you're going to progress through practices and stuff, but it's real tough for you to show up on campus your freshman year and, and try to earn a spot there. So, um, yeah, definitely go in junior college and, and learn a bunch of stuff from those coaches. That was awesome. And that took you to Lipscomb, where you now play. What's the change from JUCO to D1 ball like? It's, it's a big change, man. Um, you know, in, in junior college, you don't really regulate the amount of time that you can spend at practice. So in that aspect, it's not more tasking. like. Because at junior college, you'd, you'd be at the field sometimes for five, six hours, right, doing practices and stuff. So um, I thought I thought I'd be, you know, pre well prepared to go from junior college to Division One. But I mean, at Division One, then you also got some serious schoolwork that you got to take care of. Um, and and it was the biggest change for me was time management. Because at junior college, all you really had was you know your couple classes online or whatever, and then you just got to play baseball all day. But then you get to you get to Division One, and it's you got to wake up early. You got to go to you know study hall at 8 a.m. or whatever for an hour. Then you got two classes. Then you got to go try to find time to get a meal in. And then you got early work for hitting. And then at Lipscomb, you got to go to chapel for an hour. And then you got to you know have your two and a half hour practice or whatever the regulated time is. Um, and then you know in between that, you got conditioning and workouts. And then by the time you get home, you got to make some dinner and finish up the homework from the day that you just got done with. So. It took me probably two or three weeks to really get into a groove, um, but man, those two or three weeks were definitely grueling. Yeah, where do you find the time to breathe? Yeah, no, that's the difficult part. I was sitting there, you know, choking over myself, you know, but no, it's been fun. How did Alaska ball with the Miners last to you help in that recruitment process? It was, it was good for me. Um, you know, coming here last summer, I wasn't committed anywhere yet, so it got pretty late into the summer. I think it was, I think it was the start of July, maybe where my recruiting process with Lipscomb really picked up. Um, our director of ops guy, Brian Ryman out there, reached out to me on Twitter, actually sent me a DM, um, and he called me or whatever. And, and then I got to talking with the coaching staff there, talked with Adam Wise, who was our hitting coach last year, Jeff Forehand, um, just a phenomenal coaching staff. And I didn't even go on a visit before I committed there. So uh, I just got on the phone with them and I, and I felt a, a connection that I had with no other you know coaching staff that reached out previously. So. Just even over the phone, I knew that Lipscomb was the place for me. Um, and then, you know, showing up on campus, they have a gorgeous campus. It's in Nashville. Um, it was just a phenomenal experience getting to go to Lipscomb. Yeah, how do you like Nashville? I love Nashville. I love it. I think it's a perfect mix between, you know, obviously the baseball is absolutely fantastic. They went to original, had a really great year. The coaching staff's great. The, you know, the students, the athletes. I love everything about Lipscomb. And then, you know, when you want to get away from baseball a little bit, Nashville's great because they've got, you know, a bunch of different restaurants. A bunch of different places you can go hiking and stuff like that, see some cool scenery. So I think Nashville's a great place for me. It, it, they, they have their own Broadway street, right? Nashville does have Broadway, yes. So how is that different from, say, the main street at any other Division ones? Um, well, I went to, uh, I, I really don't know. I, I mean, I haven't been to a lot of, you know, four-year universities to visit, but um, Broadway's fun. And I'll, you know, that's it. <laughs> Good way of putting it. Yeah. Alex Vergara, episode seven of Valley Chats. I'm Jesse Cook. And that recruitment process for, for Juco ball to Division I ball has also translated into the NIL game. What was it like looking for brands yeah. to, to support when all that started? Yeah, so with the NIL deal, I mean, that whole ballpark of NIL and getting to pay players completely changed baseball. That, with the addition of the transfer portal now, everything's just been turned upside down. Um, but for me, Whenever I saw that opportunity, it wasn't so much that I could make a bunch of money, but it was, oh, maybe I could represent a couple brands and get some stuff out of it. So 
Um, I got a, a partnership with like Liquid IV. They gave me a code for some for some of this, their stuff, and then some clothing companies, um, and some you know other other little small things like gum and stuff like that. But it's been great getting to getting to build those relationships with certain companies and and kind of introduce yourself to that whole world of the business aspect of it. Um, but it's been great. Yeah, it's got to feel promising for the pro game because that's what major league athletes do is they sign sponsorship deals. Yeah, absolutely. And it, yeah, like you said, it gets you ready for that for that pro experience and and companies reaching out to you and and knowing how to carry yourself through that that process. So it's a good warm up for that. Absolutely. And again, how did that really develop for you? Was it just like you looked out and was like, hey, maybe I could take a crack at this or did people start reaching out to you? Yeah, well, so actually I had a couple friends who who reached out to companies and they were, you know, DMing them or emailing them or whatever. So that's how I got into it was I just DM'd and emailed you know, a hundred companies or however many it was on social media or email and, and then had the couple reach back out and uh, that's how it started. But yeah, just emailing them and reaching out yourself because playing at a school like Lipscomb, a, you know, a mid-major, you're not going to get the opportunities that, you know, certain power fives will get where they've got deals lined up for you the second that you walk into the doors. So yeah, just reaching out, reaching out will definitely get you a long way. And speaking about the difference between different conferences, do you feel like there's a discrepancy in play level between non-Power 5 and Power 5? Or do you think it's kind of the same? Uh, um, that's a good question. I think the biggest difference that I've noticed from playing Power 5 schools and mid-majors wasn't necessarily the competition, right? So, you know, when we're playing in the, the ASUN conference, it's a, it's a good conference, and you'll see pitchers that are throwing, you know, 92, 95, basically every single start so when you go into an SEC ballpark it's it's more the same right you're not gonna always see guys who are just top-notch arms obviously you'll run into a couple every now and then but the the difference in competition isn't it's not crazy I think the only difference that I've really noticed is the, the amount of mistakes that power fives make they give you less opportunities in the game to, to really take over um, but I wouldn't say it's it's not competition it's more consistency that's right, and you're not going to come up against Paul Skeens every game, so you don't always have those 100 mile per hour mm -hmm. throwers, but you do have a few near 100 mile per yes. hour throwers on this team, guys like Drew Christo, Will Rizzo. What's it like playing defense for those guys? Oh, it's great. I love playing behind those guys. I love playing behind all of our pitchers up here, um, but yeah, especially with those power arms, man. Um, when, you're, when you're back there in the outfield, you really want to focus on picking those guys up because they're out here working their butts off for us. Um, but it's definitely great when you're in the outfield just watching 95 blow guys up. So, yeah, it's just a lot of fun. Does the pitcher's speed change how the ball looks off the bat? You know, it, it definitely changes where you're playing in the outfield, right? Because if you're going to read a swing um, in the outfield and you can tell that he's late consistently on 95, you're going to shade a little opposite, opposite field or whatever. Um, but sometimes when you've got a guy thrown slower, then you'll play, you know, you'll play the flare or you'll play a weak fly ball because we've got a couple pitchers who – don't have the fastest velo like Larry, but he's super consistent on getting guys to jam themselves or have weak contact. So every time Larry plays or Larry pitches, I'll play shallow in left field, and that really gets me a lot of fly balls. Um, but then when you got a guy like Cristo or Rizzo, then you're going to shade, you know, Oppo and a little bit deep because if if they're going to square the ball up coming in at 95, it's going to go a little bit further than you know some of the other guys. And you know a lot about hitting, probably more than anyone else in this league, considering that you played roughly half the season and not only led the league in home runs, but the second place guy, Troy Harding, had half the number you had. He had three, you had six during the regular season. Do you like hitting against faster pitchers better than slower pitchers? You know, I think I feel, I feel a little bit indifferent, but at the same time, when I face 90-92, like that's barrel speed, so... Whenever you're facing a higher velo guy, you have less time to think. So for me, that helps me a lot. But when you're facing those guys who are throwing breakers at like 62, 63, I mean, you really have a long time to see the ball. And sometimes that makes me chase a little bit more. Um, but I think, I think to a point, you know, once you get up to 96, 97, 98, it, it does get tough. But in that, in that mid-90s range, that's where I feel most comfortable for sure. And you mentioned Larry Westall. He's your roommate up here. What's it like living with him? Oh, it's been great getting to know Larry. He's a great guy. He's a great friend. Um, and, yeah, our host family is fantastic, too, the Doggettes. Um, they've just they've made it a, a great place to come home to every day after the games. They're great people to talk to. They've got a nice family, brand-new puppy. Yeah, a nice little boxer there. And, 
And so it's, it's been a lot of fun getting to live with Larry and knowing him and his family's up here now too. So I got to meet his sister and his nephew, um, you know, a couple days or a couple weeks ago, I should say. Um, but yeah, he's great. This is Valley Chats episode seven. That's Alex Vergara. I'm Jesse Cook. And Larry is another Texas guy like you. There's a bunch of he Texas is. natives yeah. on this team. Does it sort of feel like a, a small Texas town? Yeah, I love my Texas boys. Uh, it's definitely, I, you know, I wouldn't say small Texas town, but we've got some, we've got some Texas boys in the locker room that, that let you open up a little bit, talk about some stuff that, you know, goes down. But yeah, it, it's a lot of fun to, to meet some guys and get to know where they're from around Texas, right? Because you know, growing up, you know everybody in your area, but then you meet some guys like Larry, who's from Round Rock, which is a little bit, you know, further away from Dallas than I know. But um, yeah, it's just been great getting to know everybody here. And the coaches, Steve Hecker, Pat Watson, they're both from Texas. Yep. So I know it's a big state, but yeah. that seems like a baseball hotbed. Yeah, and Kyle Watson, he lives in Keller, which is right next to me down there in Colleyville. So um, yeah, it's been great to get to know Heck. He's a great guy great father, great coach, and um, yeah, and Kyle's, you know, right outside my back door, so if I ever need anything, ever need somebody to talk to, I can just go over to, you know, Watson's house and we can chat it up, but yeah, it's been awesome. And how did you feel like you gelled with this team, joining them midway through the season, right before that big trip to the Kenai Peninsula? Yeah, so actually, Ty told me to come up here on July 1st, and I think that that was the travel date that we had to go to Kenai. Um, and I knew, you know, playing here last year, I knew how important that Kenai trip was to really get to know all the guys. So I wanted to come up here a couple days before to make sure that I could travel with everybody and spend those five days in Kenai. Um, because I think those are super important. And, you know, obviously, I think I was here three, two or three days before that. And I got to know people at, at face value. I knew their names, you know, where they were from and stuff like that. But getting to go to Kenai and, and having to, you know, be with them for five days straight with no breaks, I think it was great for me to, to, to be able to open up and you know have people open up to me and stuff like that so um, the Kenai trip definitely helped bond us and I think we've got a great group of guys and I know I'm going to stay in contact with a lot of them for the rest of my life. And that Kenai trip head coach Tyler LeBron called it a turning point in the season before you guys even went. Now that you've met these guys you've made friends with them like you said these are lifelong mm -hmm. relationships you guys immediately started winning. You entered that break 9-9 nine and, nine and left 14-7. and seven. That's impressive. Uh, yeah, we had, we had a really great bonding in, uh, in Kenai, um, you know, at the beach. It was obviously a lot of fun. And I think doing, you know, what we did down there in Kenai, it, it really brought us together, um, not just as a, a group, as a, like, you know, on the field, but as brothers off the field, right, in the locker room and everything like that. So... I think Kenai's a, it's a great opportunity and I'm, I'm really glad that we got to go at the point of the season when we did because I do think that it brought us a lot closer, gelled us together a lot. Because I know Chugiak, I mean they just went in the last week of the season, right? So it's definitely valuable to go to Kenai when you still got a lot of ways to go um, in the season because it'll help you, uh, help you, you know, finish the season off strong for sure. Finish the season off strong and like you said, bond as a team. I mean, you're living shoulder to shoulder, elbow to elbow oh, yeah. in that Bingo Hilton Hotel that I have heard described as a college dorm or army barracks without a roof. Yeah, man, Kenai's rough, dude. Uh, there's no, I'm not gonna sugarcoat it at all. Um, it doesn't really have Florida, Florida ceiling walls. You know, you can look over on one bunk bed and see the other side of the place, but I enjoyed it. You gotta, you gotta, Accept where you are, all right? Because it's easy to go to a place like that and, and complain about the living situation and, you know, everything like that. And the weather down there in Kenai is never great. So to go down there and have a couple games get rained out, you know, we didn't know what we were doing half the days because we would show up at the field, puddles everywhere. Looks like everyone's just got their, you know, hands in their pockets. The other team's kicking around the dirt, not really taking charge on what's going on, which was a little frustrating to see. But, um, yeah, go down there. What did... I mean, how many, we won a majority of the games there? Three or four. Three or four, yeah, which is great. You always want to, you know, when you're going to a place like that, you want to enjoy the experience and suck everything up and then win those games that you're playing. So, um, yeah, it was, it was a great experience for us. You guys won three of those four games. You turned that into a great end-of-season push to take the team into first place. You hit two home runs in that crucial double header on Monday to snatch first place from the Glacier Pilots. What was the message going into this week? Keep it rolling, man. Uh, keep it rolling. The, the regular season's over. It's great that we won the, you know, won the league or whatever, but 
for us to get home field advantage, I think was great for the fans. You know, they can come out here and support us. They don't gotta make that drive to Anchorage. Um, but the message was definitely keep all the progress that we've got picked up during the regular season and just push it on to the playoffs. Cause I think once we get rolling and you know, as we've been rolling, it's, it's hard for teams to stop us. And the Glacier Pops got a day off. They swept the Bucks. You guys have yep. played three straight games after that doubleheader the day before. How do you stay motivated? How do you stay ready? It's just next man up mentality, you know. Um, obviously, our starters who have thrown now, it's going to be tough for them to try to recover and get back for this next series. Um, but it's next guy up. So I trust every single guy in our bullpen. I know everybody on our team does. And, and now it's just time to step up. You know, it's, it's time to make some money. So we just got to bring it to them. And what's your key to this final series to go back and win against the Glacier Piles and take home that trophy? Just have fun, man. Just have fun. You got to you got to realize what you're doing, right? We're out here in Alaska. It's a gorgeous place to be. You got to realize that we're, you know, it, it is the championship game, but it's just like every other game. You can't go into it thinking this is the biggest game of our lives, right? Like we have to win this. You just got to go in there, have fun, compete, and baseball take care of itself. Just have fun. That's a pretty good way of looking at life. That's Alex Vergara, Matt Sues, all ABL, left fielder, center fielder, wherever you want to play in the outfield, in the 2022 ABL MVP. I'm Jesse Cook. Thank you so much for watching, and thank you, Alex. Yeah, absolutely. Enjoy the game.